Hi there. How are you doing today? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you, Sarada? Good. Danish, are you in Davis? Hello. Yeah, I actually live in Sacramento, but yes, I go to UC Davis. Yeah, I'm in Placerville right now. I don't know if you know what that is. Oh, okay. Down the okay, street. Yeah. Awesome. I know Pleasantville. What are you doing there, Dimitri? Placerville. It's uh, my wife's grandma's house. Oh, sorry. I guess I misheard what you said originally. I guess I don't know it then. Are you just here for a little bit or? Just for vacation um, or something, or like, actually a little over a month. Oh, okay. We have family here. So you're in the same time zone as me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, I know Davis pretty well. I spent some time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've been there. Well, yeah, I mean, my 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 dad works in Davis as well, and of course, I go to been going to school at Davis and. So yeah. <laughs> so you commute? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't. I mostly work from home anyway. Now that I'm focused on my research and given my research, it's all deep learning stuff. <laughs> I can I can do most of that from home. So I mostly nice. work from home. But yeah. <laughs> Anybody got any uh, APO news or anything else? interesting happening well i was able to get um a simple csv file loaded and oh, calculate and graph that. a moving average so I that was that. exciting that is exciting i'm going to share my screen so i can show people oh there's quite a lot here actually um where was that is that in study group three that was in tabular data. That that was oh, a yeah. cool um, assignment thing that was very helpful as I was developing, though. What was this one? Uh, at the bottom. Oh, you mean the assignment. This, this but... assignment, yeah. I was able to kind of assign things to to the display, the special character, and then that let me print out different parts of the formula in order to um, oh. print you mean out you've got quad values. in the middle. That's right. And yeah, so three will get printed it. whenever it runs, but it's six will get assigned to Z. So okay, that was, that's neat. That was pretty handy. So quad doesn't have to be the far left thing. I mean, of course it doesn't when you think about it, but I hadn't thought about it. So it's basically like a print statement. You can chuck it anywhere you like. Yeah, which which is really nice if you're trying to debug what you're doing. But anyway, uh, tabular data theme. was where the post was. Mm. And I love that you're using the quarto thing to publish it too. So, um, okay, so you've got an end of day quote data CSV file. So I noticed um, Dialog has, okay, so you said Dialog has a CSV thing built in. So do their built in functions tend to start with quad? Is that like how they spell them? Do you know? I think for a lot of the IO ones, I think. Um, I don't really know for sure, but I, I know they've got like a CSV. I think they've got an XML and a JSON as well. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they don't have anything for like JPEGs or PNGs or images, but they've they've got a few uh, starting mm -hmm. with quad. Got it. The way that you exit out of a dialog repo is using quad off as well, like capital letters off. As in e o f or uh, off like o -F -F. Oh, off mm -hmm. o f f got it and I guess this is like indexing the first five by three bit that's right yeah okay um, looks like you need to make this a markdown cell so. oh then you're doing some masking with booleans. 
Anyway, I don't understand all this stuff yet, but I guess we'll get there. Um, well, I can really walk cool. through it. There's there's some if you if you'd like, or we can. Yeah, kind of no, I think I'd rather it walk through it. Symbols. Yeah, I'd rather re walk through it once we know all the glyphs. Um, cool. But look at that! You've got a plot, so that's great. And right square bracket seems to be another thing that's used for kind of like, I don't know, I think they're maybe not APO functions, but they're dialogue commands or something, these right square bracket things. Yeah, I'm not really clear um, all the conventions for what all those, you know, mean and, and when to look for something in right square bracket versus there's some that are right parentheses and others that are plot. I'm not really sure what the, the difference between them all is. Yeah. Um, and is this um is this basically indexing into the, th the indexing the third column and all the rows? Is that yes. what that means? Okay. So that would be the same yep. as colon, comma three in PyTorch or NumPy. Yeah. And I guess this is just printing out the fact that it didn't return anything, which it considers to be a a null array. Well that's then awesome. That's, uh... Really so cool. yeah, I'm hoping to build up more complexity over time in this, and eventually I'd like to get a random forest going. But that seems mm -hmm. like a um, of course not a, a good first forest. step. So <laughs> no, I mean I know trees are something which like people say APL is really well suited to, but it doesn't feel well suited to, and you have to kind of learn the tree techniques for APL, which is something I would be fascinated to learn about as well. So um, yeah, fun day. Um, I wanted to have a quick diversion, if you guys don't mind, into something I just thought um, is of great value, um, which is, uh, I've mentioned Anki before. Do any of you guys use Anki or SuperMemo or any other repetitive space learning things? Um, uh, well, in that case, yeah. For learning vocabulary, right? Kind of like uh, for re remembering literally anything. Yeah. Um, so, all right. As I guess, um, let me explain. Because, like, this is not exactly APL, but it's also like the most important single thing I know of the learning things. So, including APL. Um, so um, so there was this guy called um, Ebbinghaus who um, developed this idea or discovered really this idea called the forgetting curve. <clears throat> um, and um, yeah, as it says here, it's in the 1880s. Um, and basically what he did was he um, set up this really boring experiment where he had to try and remember a list of random sets of letters, like look at them and then remember them the next day. And then he tracked over time, like each day, how many he remembered. Um, so um, this is like the percent that he remembered, and this would be like the day. Um, and yeah, it like followed this kind of shape, right? Where um, actually it's try to redraw that, this kind of shape. Um, so like he discovered he forgot a lot of them really quickly. Um, but some of them stuck around. Um, and I mean, it should, it doesn't asymptote, of course, it goes to zero. It should show it go to zero. Um, this is actually already interesting in itself because like a lot of people, particularly adults, I find, um, feel disheartened and frustrated when they forget things and they think it shows that they have a bad memory. Um, but that's not true. Actually, all humans rapidly forget new things that we learn. 
And so then um, what he tried doing was saying, well, what would happen if I, if he um, restudies his random sets of letters one day later? Um, and to restudy them, he basically gave, he gave himself a quiz to try to remember them, right? And then if you didn't know the answer, you would, you would check it. And so, of course, immediately after that, um, his, he was back to 100, well, you know, 100%-ish or whatever his kind of base recall level is. And of course, after that, he started getting it. But interestingly, he didn't forget it as quickly. And then if a couple of days later, he gave himself a quiz again, and then followed to see how long he remembered things for, it was flatter still. And then if he did it again a week or two later, it really hardly started, you know, found that it was hardly forgetting things at all. Um, and so this is the key to remembering things basically forever. Um, and there's a absolutely amazing website that nobody knows about um, called Super Memo. Um, and so for Super Memo is software. Um, but it's also this, um, there's heaps of research. Basically, it's by a guy who's dedicated his whole life to using this technique to remember as many things as possible and to basically organize his whole life. Um, I uh, got all these rules of knowledge formulation. So the guy's name is Pierre Wozniak, and he's absolutely amazing. Um, so he actually rediscovered this stuff from Ebbinghaus independently, um, but then has greatly developed it over the last few decades. Um, so there's this uh, piece of software called Anki, which you can just say, okay, I want to learn, I want to remember something. So you give yourself a quiz question, right? So uh, for example, if you want to remember what monadic plus is on a complex number, you can like, you know, type in some, something like that. And obviously I should use a proper negative, but I'm not using an APL keyboard here. And then you'd put in the correct answer here or whatever. And so then you'd say add and it, and it creates a question. And so what then happens is <clears throat> next time you open Anki and you say, and you say study, and it will start showing you your questions. And um, if you get it right, you can say it was, you know, you basically either hit one, two, three, or four to say I got it wrong or I got it but right, but it was hard. I got it right, it was okay, I got it right, it was easy. And you can see here, if I say I got it right and it was easy, it's gonna be about 10 minutes before it shows it to me again. That's because this is new, right? And then the next time I do it, if I get it right again, it'll give it'll be a day. And then if I get it right again, it'll be like four days. And if I get it right again, it'll be like two weeks. Um, and once you get it right like five or six times in a row, it'll be a month or two before you see it again. Because it's because the thing about the forgetting curve is that the better you know something, the less often you have to revise it. Um, so um, this deck is actually um, my daughter's and her friend, so Claire and Gabe's deck. Um, I've just got a little bit of it here, and so you can browse it and you can see, like, you know, we've got things like fractions, and we've got things like the successor function. And we've got things like bind and out of product because they're doing both math and APL at the same time. You know, I guess a bit like us, um, but they haven't done lots of things before. Um, so yeah, so I've got something here saying, oh, what happens if you do divide, jot, divide? Call that F and you call F of that. And as we'll learn that basically you actually get back the same thing because that means reciprocal or reciprocal. Um, so I try to come up with questions that force them to like both remember the technique, but also 
you know, utilize some thinking. Um, so yeah, so Gabe and Claire, if they remember, or if their parents managed to convince them, they try to do their Anki every day. And um, at first it was like a bit of a struggle um, to get them to do it. But now that like we've been doing it for a month or two, probably more like two, there are things they learned a couple of months ago now and that it gets popping up on Anki and, it, and they press good and they can see that they won't see it again for like three months. And they're like, oh, this is awesome. You know, so it's gradually getting easier and easier. Anyway, so I just wanted to mention this because given we're all learning something um, new, this is a good way to remember, you know, the alphabet of glyphs. Um, and so I actually used this for Chinese um, 10 years ago or something. Um, yeah, and the reason it's impossible to forget something is if you say I got this wrong, it resets back the forgetting curve back to showing you again tomorrow and then three days and then five days or whatever, you know. So um, so as long as you do Anki regularly, it's impossible to forget the things that are there. Um, it does mean that's important to only put in things there that you really do want to remember forever because, you know, otherwise you're going to be spending all this time quizzing yourself on stuff that you actually don't care about. And you can always go back and delete things, but, you know. Um, uh, hey, don't forget to tell me things vocally rather than putting in the chat. Okay, so in the chat, Tanish mentions that Radek has this nice thing called AI quizzes, which is really cool. And um, is Radek on the call? How did you, if we use, how did you get the spaced repetition going? Is there a Python module for this or something? Uh, I implemented it in Ruby on, I think it might be on the Super Memo website. Oh, I'm you use sure, the algorithm they have, but, yeah. But the algorithm is there, yeah. Somewhere. They've got lots of algorithms, right? Like Super Memo algorithm version, whatever, SM17. So there is, M2. yes, there is, uh, I think, some commercial product uh, from what I remember. And That's right. They use some version of the algorithm there that is not published, ah. but uh, the earlier version okay. had it published and uh, uh, I made some tiny modifications to simplify it. I see. So he put it in his Jeremy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. So uh, can you uh, click on the first link that I sent uh, on the chat? Absolutely. Once I remind so that is the best thing I have uh, yet found on the topic of space repetition. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Um, and hello, by the way, Rito, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's Rita. Yeah. Hi. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Sure. Where are you joining us from? Uh, from India. It's it's five thirty in the uh -huh. morning here. All right. Yeah. Whereabouts in India are you? Um, Kolkata. Kolkata. Yeah. Okay. Calcutta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know Koreans in India as well. Um, mm -hmm. And India is all one time zone. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So it's it's somewhat impractical because uh, the time it is almost like midday in some parts. In some parts, it's barely daylight. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Australia is like got so many time zones. <laughs> and, and this is the first time I am actually adjusting to Australian time zone because uh -huh. before I adjusted to American and European. Yeah, the first yeah. Time, yeah. Yeah, we do that too. So like a lot of the stuff we do is in the US. So we have an early start and an early end to our day for yeah. that reason. All right, thanks for the tip. Do you miss things about the So US have channel? you seen, uh, there's like some work by Michael Nielsen, I think. Mm. Like there was a, I think like a quantum computing book, but it was like all with space repetition. Yeah, yeah. it's called Quantum Country, yeah. Yeah. Quantum dot country. Yeah. And yeah, I think yeah, he has a lot of discussion film. about about space repetition and things like that as well. Yeah. 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 yeah he came That's to it pretty really late. Um, but he. Uh, so the nice thing just, about Michael uh, is put on the address bar, uh, quantum dot country, that mm -hmm. will open the site. Mm -hmm. Just quantum dot country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Michael came to uh, uh, space repetition pretty 
recently, but he tends to get into things deeply when he gets into things, which is great. So uh, yeah, him and Andy. So Andy used to be at um, Khan Academy. Um, nice. Jeremy, have you been using uh, this for APL at all? The uh, Anki stuff? Uh, um, only kind uh, and yes, indirectly, because I help my daughter with her cards sometimes. So, therefore, I end up doing it as well, which seems to be enough because I haven't forgotten any glyphs yet. If I do find I start forgetting some glyphs, I will do my own. Um, I just want to point out, like um, when I was working with Jeremy in the beginning. I used to complain that, hey, like, I'm, I can't remember stuff. Like, Jeremy would also tell me sometimes, hey, you don't remember stuff. And then I would also say, hey, I feel like I don't remember anything. Maybe I'm just dumb. And he actually sent me some uh, some books. Uh, by There was one by uh, Barbara Oakley, for example, who also does a Coursera course. Like, I think it's the most popular Coursera course, learning how to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really interesting. Uh, and then you sent me another one by about like the guys like professional memory. Uh, I think that one is working with M Yeah, with Ed yeah. Cook. Um, so Ed Cook um, the memory was the world memory champion, and uh, he actually created a startup called Memrise. Um, which actually adds uh, an additional thing, which is if you want to really remember things well, you need a mnemonic for them, something to make it click in your head, you know, and preferably connections to other things, which actually for APL is easy because most of the APL glyphs have their own mnemonic already, you know, they're, they're, they're drawn that way for a reason. Um, but he actually is particularly did this for Chinese um, to make sure that each of the um, Hunt's uh, characters had some kind of mnemonic picture and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, so Ed Cook also was the topic of a book, um, uh, Moonwalking with Einstein, which is a really nice book. And it's one of those books that might help you change your understanding of yourself because um, Josh was a guy, he was, I think, a journalist at the time. Um, who thought of himself as somebody who had a bad memory. Um, and he teamed up with Ed Cook to learn memory techniques. And yeah, so the whole book's kind of all about his journey. And interestingly, Josh actually um, went on to create something you might've come across. Um, which is Atlas Obscura. If you've seen that, it's a very cool, very cool website full of interesting things. Cool. Um, thanks for letting me have a little bit of a diversion. So I had one question about maybe a little bit more about the history and terminology of APL. Mm. For example, like I was, uh, you know, I think yesterday you we had gone over the Zilde symbol. Yeah. But like it technically looks like a theta symbol, right? Uh, so not quite. It's got a squiggle. It's a squiggly theta. Yeah. So like, Let I guess, see. but I'm just generally wondering where did these names come from? Like, okay. it so it's kind of completely like unlike what it should be called like if you're looking at the Greek letters or whatever. So I'm kind of confused yeah. from that. Well, OK, so I mean, this is not the Greek letter, so it's not wrong. The ones that are Greek letters are correct. So alpha is called alpha, iota is called iota, and omega is called uh, omega. Um, um, there, there is a thought that even those shouldn't be there because like they give preferential treatment to people of kind of European backgrounds who might recognize Greek letters. Um, you know, but uh, generally, um, so they were all uh, created by Ken Iverson and his wife. And uh, I think like his wife like drew them or something. Um, and they're designed to be 
they're designed to be mnemonic, right? So for example, equals is the equals we recognize. And it means that um, uh, one, two, three equals two, two, three will do a element wise equality and return a Boolean. And like this one here is like extremely I think you're equal showing to, your screen. Oh, I'm not way. showing my screen. Sorry. I always forget. Um, share screen. Uh, share screen. Share screen. Okay. So one, two, three equals two, two, three gives 001 because it's element wise equals. Um, and yes, yeah, so I was just showing you on the Zilda here that it's actually not a tilde. Um, and so this one here, I kind of think of as like extremely equal to, um, because it checks whether two things are exactly the same items and exactly the same shape, um, I believe, something like that. Yes, it checks whether, as you can see. So exactly, so that example one, oh, hang on, I should change, I got the wrong symbol here. So is it, uh, da, da. there we go, okay. So these are equal and, all right, one equals, uh, is extremely equal to, is false because they're different lengths. Where else is normal equals to is like broadcasted element wise. So there's these kind of like mnemonics, you know, and then obviously this is the like not version of that. Um, and then some of them are kind of like borrowed from other areas. A lot of them just draw uh, drawings of things. So this is the thing on the left hand side of a um, uh, of a function. This is on the right hand side of a function. This is the biggest thing and the littlest thing. So yeah, th they made them up basically. Um, um, and then somebody, I think in the chat, Wasim says, Zilda is a portmanteau of zero tilde, which is exactly what it is. It's a zero with a tilde through it. So were they, I guess when these were created, because like these are all Unicode characters, right? So they are now. When they, yeah. they are now. Okay. So before they were not really they part of not. Unicode. And, so one okay. of the things that really helped a lot was um, there are these things called golf ball typewriters. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they're just, they're like normal typewriters, but instead of like lots of little different things that bang, there's a single thing that spins around and goes up and down to bang. And there was a APL one of those that was created. Um, and apparently that helped a lot because then people could like easily typeset things. But until that time, my understanding is that um, Ken and his wife, I can't quite remember her name, Jeanette or something. Um, yeah, they basically would like draw them and then stick them in the right place and, you know, typeset in that rather old fashioned way. So yeah, it must have been a lot of work. But I think like most math was probably done that way anyway. So yeah, they ended up becoming part of Unicode. Um, but of course, you know, fonts, most fonts don't have all Unicode characters in. Um, and so if you're wondering why it is that you can look at like a web page or something with APL characters, even if you don't have an APL font installed, your, comp your operating system behind the scenes tries to find any font that contains a character that's, that's needed and will generally show it to you using that font if it, if it can. And it only falls back to the kind of like question mark or box if it can't find it at all. Um, there's a really, actually a really great font. It's kind of like my favorite coding font in some ways anyway, which is Josefka. And Josefka Extended contains all of APL in quite a nice way and pretty much everything else. And it's a really nice font. Um, so if you're ever wondering what font to use for your terminal, 
picking this one is not a bad choice. I don't know how they created so many characters and variants. Quite amazing. Uh, OK. How did you so, learn about that font? Like, how did that? Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, um, I tend to learn about everything, mainly from Twitter, and then some things from like Hacker News, mm -hmm. and some things from like following links from one of those places and finding things. Um, okay, uh, so. All right, so we've got a kernel running. Um, I don't think there's probably anything to call. No, oh, there is. That oh, might have just been GH pages. Hamill or anybody, do you know if there's a way to like ignore a branch? Like I never need GH pages locally, right? Is there, and that's going to update a lot more. I only really want to pull master. I don't know if that's possible. All right. Um, I thought we could do like um, some Boolean stuff today. If that sounds all right for everybody. Um, so these are all pretty straightforward, I think, unless some of the monadic ones are weird. Looks like equals doesn't have a monadic version. Dialog language elements. Oh, if anybody's interested, oh, okay, I've got a couple of ideas for coding projects, if anybody's interested. The first is um, this here, when rendered, is you know an APL character in backticks. I think ideally we'd want it to automatically hyperlink to the dialog documentation. Wouldn't that be cool? So if we went to here, here. Um, yeah, it'd be nice if these were all automatic hyperlinks to the documentation. So if anybody's interested in trying that, um, the way you would implement it is um, you would, we're using, um, well, I think Isaac's about to change this to use MB process. And in MB process, which is going to become MB dev two in a couple of weeks, um, there's basically a list of like um, processes, which are like all the things we do to change cells. And you can see each one's normally just two or three lines of code. Um, that's one piece. And then another piece is um, doc links, which is the thing that does this in Python. So in Python, I've got something, I guess it'd be better to look at the notebook actually. Um, dark links. So you've probably noticed that in NB Dev websites, we automatically um, hyperlink anything that's in backticks. So here's an example. So in the source, this just said backtick numpy.array, and it's automatically been hyperlinked. And the way that's done is we use Linkify. 
so that splits the lines up. It goes to each line, checks whether or not we're in a fenced area or not. And then once we find the right lines, we create links in them, um, which is done using this class. So yeah, there might be some way to do that in APL. So that'd be, that's one idea for a um, project. Um, another idea for a project is um, Anki is really useful for me as a teacher, um, but I have to use this kind of hacky approach to use it as a teacher. Um, so I've created a deck for Gabe and Claire called Super School, and they both also have decks called Super School. And each time I do a lesson with them, I add some cards to the deck. And then I go file export. And I then make this a collection package, sorry, a deck package containing just that deck. And I export it to a file. And then I send them that, that file. They click on it. It opens and it imports that into their decks. So it means that I can create cards for my students. In this case, it's Claire and Gabe, and they can import them. Um, but we each, you know, we each have our own independent decks. So it means they can add stuff to their deck that I don't have in mine or study other topics or whatever. So this project idea is make this all much simpler. Like, so Anki does actually have an online version. Anki web. Um, so there must be, so there's an API for syncing with it. Um, and um, there's quite a few versions of Anki that are open source. So I guess it's all documented in API. Yeah, it'd be nice if there was some way, maybe through some online interface to add cards and it would automatically like send them off to each person or something. Um, yeah, some easier way for teachers to send cards off to their off to their students. Um, and there's lots of stuff you could add to that, right? You could then like add some way for then teachers to actually check how the students are going, make sure that they're actually not behind. Because what happens is if you don't study your cards, then this learning number will go up and up and up. Um, and then the other thing I have to do is after each time I export, I then have to go and browse and delete all the cards that are there so that the next time I export there, I'm only exporting the new cards. So there's definitely room to create some kind of cool system for a more, you know, collaborative learning approach with spaced repetition, um, which I think could leverage Anki. And Anki's written in Python, by the way. Anyway, that was a little aside. Um, okay. So equals and my guess was that this was equals. Yeah, is that it? Yeah. Gets confusing with the underline. Okay, so there's no diet, there's no monadic equals. I might just make this into a little template that I can copy and paste. Okay, it'll save me some time. Equals, and it's called equal sign. Um, monadic doesn't exist. Okay, dyadic equals means equal to. All right, so one equals one. Oops. One equals one, two, one equals one, one, 
Any other interesting examples? Oh yeah, strings. So um, probably useful to think about why this works. So this is remember is um, a special case. It's a it's a character. You know, it's a single character. Where else? And there's more than one. It becomes a, a array of characters. So this is a single character. So it'll be broadcast over all these characters, and so it'll end up being the same as banana equals, and then. Oopsie daisy. It'll be the same as that. Every second letter in banana is an A. That's something <laughs> yes. I didn't know before. There you go. So, uh, hey, banana I, I consists. It, yeah. I think okay. if you if you do um, this equals a and you have um, a list of words, so like banana and and apple, mm -hmm. I think it will still go. Um, I think it will still go element wise through each one um, rather than looking at that higher level, I think. Nope. Uh, sorry, I meant the banana and apple on the left hand side. Okay. Equals A. Okay. I think. Oh, okay. So you're not saying, you're not saying this, you're saying this. Okay. And so I can tell you why that is. That's because a scalar can broadcast over a matrix. And I think that that creates, I think that's like internally a matrix. And so then if you do equals apple, it will not find apple, I think. Hang on, let me just uh, get my thing going here. Oh, that's interesting. That's three things. OK, I'm a bit confused about strings. Sorry, what were you saying we could do? Yeah, so I think now if you do like the same banana apple candy is mm -hmm. equal to apple, mm -hmm. I think it will not. It'll also do element wise. And so right. uh, which is, which is a any, right. I I had a lot of problems with this and the moving yeah. the filtering. The yeah, so um, NumPy broadcasts vectors over matrices, whereas APL doesn't. Um, so at some point, we'll come across something called the each operator, which will work around that problem. All right, cool. Um, and actually, to make this more consistent, I should run everything above. I can't quite see, because this is in the way. So run all above. You know, we could almost generate a. Uh, we could almost generate an Anki deck automatically from this notebook that you're writing, Jeremy. Oh wow, that would be another interesting exercise. Mm. Love it. Yeah, that would be sweet. All right, I will try to continue to write it in a way that would be that would yeah that would make sense to do that. I certainly think so far it does. Uh, okay, that's interesting. So not equals does have a monadic version. Not equals. And I think it's going to be helpful during the Booleans quite early because you use Booleans a lot. And when we say Boolean, we mean, um, Arrays containing zeros and ones. Oh, wait, how did I get to there? Not equals. I don't see them. Mon wait, monadic not equal is not defined. Monadic not equal is unique mask. Whoa. OK, that's crazy. Um, oh, look, this is 17.1. What if I type 18.2 up here? Huh, okay, 
Oh, that's a bit tricky. Um, let's see if they also now have a uh, monadic equals. Things are changing. That's cool. They don't. OK. Monadic not equal means unique mask. Well, this is one of the things that happens when you search for documentation using Google. It mm. often returns the older version. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it looks like you can use you can use close what right square bracket help followed by a glyph and then execute oh, okay. and that opens the doc. Okay, great. And uh does that even work here? Um yeah. sorry, tell me what to type again. Help. Help with a capital H or doesn't matter? Uh I don't think it matters. Okay. And then the glyph. Oh, love it. Okay, that's that's a winning trick. Let's put that up here. All lowercase works as well. And I think with this string, the broadcasting only happens for only one character, I think. Mm -hmm. So can you say that at this point? Well, I want to learn more about exactly what's going on. Um, and we actually haven't talked about broadcasting at all yet. Mm -hmm. Yes. So like so, in NumPy, they do whenever it is compatible. The shape yes, doesn't matter. That's right. Itself. Uh, NumPy does what we would call trailing axis. So NumPy, as long as the the last axes are match, it will broadcast over the, the leading axes. Um, exactly. J, J and BQN do the opposite. So they will, as long as the leading axes match, it will broadcast over the trailing axes. Um, APL does neither. APL only broadcasts scalars or does element-wise of matching shapes. So otherwise you have to use this thing we will come across called called um, each. So I think we'll leave broadcasting maybe until we get to each. Yeah, I think I used in close for that. So now I'm, now I'm questioning if I did it the right way. Oh, well, I, I'm not, yeah. I Because I haven't gotten to it yet, I, I don't actually know the fully correct answer to this. So I'm sure you know more about it than I do. Um, uh, here we are. Well, I don't know the each operator, so it's, uh, I think I'm just as dark. <laughs> um, so there's this, yeah, they call it each on that. Um, yeah, Jay has a more. Oh, I've used that. I, this. Yes, I need Enki. Um, quite right. Um, and then there's also um, rank. I don't remember which one is rank, but anyway, let's let's get to that when we get to it. Um, okay, so we've got to figure out what not equals does. Unique mask. Let's start with their examples. Now that we know about strings, their examples are going to make more sense. And so control shift dash is very useful for splitting a cell. And then um, control or apple left square bracket to unindent. Uh, <coughs> OK, I can already see what this is. It tells you whether or not the thing in this position, whether we've seen it before in this list. So that's unique. So far, that's unique so far, that's unique so far. We have seen that before, so it's a zero. And so presumably at some point, we're going to learn how to use this to 
access just the elements of this which are true and then that'll be how we would create a unique list of elements. Yep, if it's a first occurrence, got it. Yeah, it's, I think it's nice to have a numeric example as well. Okay, we're happy with that. That's weird. Um, okay, these all look fine, I guess. Okay, so dyadic eight not equal to oh, I suppose I should have unindented all of those at once, it would have been faster, but never mind. Okay. Not sure this one adds much. Keep it as simple as possible, shall we? Okay. You're zipping along with the easy ones. So these are presumably going to be easy as well, although the monadic versions may be odd. We will find out. Oh, okay, that's easy. Less than. Less than sign. Less than. Okay, so what I should do actually is do that, and then that, and then that. Cool. And I assume greater than is going to be the same. All right. Greater is than the broadcasting same. supposed to work just like characters even here? Yeah, yeah, this is just a one element. This is just a, sorry, this is just a a, a, a scalar, a, you know, a, a, a string. So and Not there, not there, below, oh, for sorry. the less than, yeah. Yeah, for the less than, yeah, it should be exactly the same. So you've got a scalar here and, okay. a and an array here, so the scalar will mm -hmm. broadcast over the array. Okay, so if we have a matrix and uh, a vector, then will not it work. Not work. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Without using each. All right. But we will get to it, so let's we'll get there. Greater than. I guess it's fine. We've got some which are a bit trivially easy because we can just go fast. All right. So what about the greater than equal twos? Are they all? Cool. All right, so we may as well just copy this. And we could just say less than or equal to. Less than. Ugh. Crap. That did not work at all. Less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, than or equal to, and how do we type these? Six and four. I see, so we've got four, six, eight. 
um, is this one four because it's the smallest? Yes, it is. That's good. So this will be six. six. And then we'll need that here as well. Four, whoops. And six. Okay. All right. Um, I guess we're up to this one. Oh, depth. Okay. Yeah, so when um, a character is the same as another character, but with an extra underline, they use the word underbar. So for example, there's an iota underbar and there's an epsilon underbar. What other ones are there? Equal underbar, there's one. Left shoe underbar, I think that's it. And this is comma bar because it's not underneath it. Okay, so equals under bar is colon. Equal under bar. And the monadic version of that is depth. And the dyadic version of that is match. Okay, depth, that's not quite right. Um, let's see if we can guess first. So can anybody figure it out? Depth is 70, zero. EBC, is it the same as rank? Not quite. Oh, this is like not consistent. What does that do? Hmm. And what about this? What does this do? Okay. Um, we're going to have to introduce something new first then, which is arrays and arrays. Um, let's see, where's a good place to put that? Should we have a, like a complex object section or something like the basic object? Maybe just doing, just fixing up. I always get these heading levels wrong. Um, basic objects here, real. Um, I was going to say some objects, <laughs> and <laughs> um, then we can say. Arrays in arrays. Yes, because we don't need to know about matrices to be able to do this. Um, and I think um, single characters and multi length characters are handled differently and nest differently if they're mixed with numbers. Mm, okay, let's got some examples I could use. Um, so if we've got like one, two, three, four, 
A, B, you mean something like this? Um, I think if you just do like, uh, even without the parentheses, like uh -huh. one, two, three, four, A, B, uh -huh. I think it will, it will nest the A and the, the A, B. Hmm. Um, and I think that's, it's, I think it does something a little bit different if you just do one, two, three, four, and then just A, if I hmm. remember right. That sounds right, because it wouldn't be a list. Um, okay, so the reason is, actually, is that this one here is identical to this, and that this is actually a array, and so this is actually an array. So this is an array containing an array, and this is also an array containing an array. And so let's move this one up here. All right, great. Seems like a good place to stop, I think. And we can look at match tomorrow. All right. Thanks all. Well, this was fun as usual. Thank mm -hmm. you for uh, hosting, Jeremy. My pleasure. Thank you for joining. See you again. Yeah, I have yeah, I have sorry, little something to add. Yeah. So uh, when you said like uh, those characters are in Greek and they actually benefit uh, Europeans, not mm. quite. I mean, if you have taken math in high school, you know all the Greek alphabets. Oh basically. yeah, I know. I know yeah, but... physics, chemistry, everything it has Greek alphabets. But I mean, I've forgotten it all. I I have I have a hard time remembering all the characters, and I always mean to go <laughs> back and learn them, and mm -hmm. I just never do. And... I've, you I know, mean, they I've, can get I've, really confusing if you know other languages like Russian, because like the the R in Russian comes from the Greek Rho, but their character is just a P. <laughs> so that's a huge pet peeve of mine is you have a lot of like redundant char yeah. <clears throat> characters when you're using those uh, Greek letters. So there's this um, one of the guys <laughs> that, that wrote a lot of the stuff in Dialogue APL left and created a new language called BQN. And one of the things he did in his simple set was not to have any any characters from an alphabet, full stop. And this um, is better. Which, yeah, it was a decision. I mean, I guess these are letters. I don't know why he can justify these exactly, but I guess they're kind of not because they've got an extra dash on them or something. I don't know. Anyway. All right. Bye, all. Have a good day. Yeah, bye. See you bye. Bye.